I'm Father Anthony Chicana. As predicted, this year is turning out to be one of controversy among traditionalists over the question of the Pope and its relation to the disaster in the post-Vatican II Church. First, there is the ever-increasing number of outrageous statements and gestures from Bergoglio. On one occasion recently, he claimed that John the Baptist doubted whether Christ was the Messiah. On another, he allowed himself to be invested with a clown stole. He's also planned a trip to Sweden to honor Luther and the beginning of the Protestant revolt. That's one of the Lutheran lady bishops there. Second, there's the debate sparked by true or false Pope, a book-length anti sede vacantis screed published by the Society of St. Pius X and written by John Salsa and Robert Sisko. The two sides to the debate line up as follows. On one side, there are sedevacantists like me. We maintain that the post-conciliar popes could not be considered true popes for the reason that they were public heretics who as such could not therefore validly obtain the papal office or papal authority. On the other side, there are the adherents of the R and R position, like the Society of St. Pius X and Messrs. Salsa and Sisko. They insist one must recognize the post-conciliar popes as true popes, but nevertheless resist them by rejecting their teachings, their laws, their rights, and their commands. Since January 1st, I've put out three longer videos dealing with some of the general themes in the Salsa Cisco SSPX book, and you can count on more of these. But before the next one appears, I decided to inaugurate a series of shorter videos treating some particular points in their arguments that can be handled separately. This series I call Pope Fictions, and our first installment today is entitled Nestorian Storytime. By this time, most sedevacantists believe that at least the more recent post-Vatican II popes were public heretics before their elections, and hence not true popes in the first place. The Cisco Salsa SSPX book resurrected an older debate, which is therefore out of date. That is, the issue of when exactly a true pope who later becomes a public heretic would lose his office or lose his authority. Even though I consider the issue moot, it still needs to be addressed in some fashion because Messrs. Salsa and Sisko make it part of their attacks against sedevacantism. Here, before we get to the Nestoria story, is the heart of the dispute. By the 20th century, Catholic theologians and canonists unanimously taught that a pope who later becomes a public heretic would lose his office automatically as a matter of divine law. This position came to be adopted because of the teaching of St. Robert Bellarmine in his De Romano Pontifice. It is ultimately rooted in a basic theological truth that no one disputes. To be a member of the church, one must one, be baptized, and two, profess the Catholic faith. Public heresy destroys the latter condition. By divine law, you automatically lose your membership in the church. And with it, if you are a cleric, your office or your authority. And this was the principle that sedevacantists appealed to in order to draw their conclusions about Paul VI and his successors. The R&R &R camp, on the other hand, 
maintains that a heretical pope would not lose his office or authority automatically by divine law, but only after he was found guilty at a trial conducted by the cardinals or a council of bishops. They appealed to the writings of three theologians to support their position, but this broader issue we will slug out later if necessary. What concerns us at the moment is one specific error Messer Salsa and Sisko make to support this argument when they appeal to the case of the 5th century heretic Nestorius, Patriarch of Constantinople. This error appears on pages 304 to 309 of their book, and they repeat it in a recent polemical article on their site. That's my distinguished colleague, Bishop Donald Sanborn there, one of their targets. Attempting to draw an analogy to defeat the general principle behind our position, Messrs. Salsa and Sisko assert that, quote, Nestorius was not deposed by divine law the moment he began preaching heresy, but was instead deposed after the church itself rendered a judgment. All very grand. But for further enlightenment on this point, we turn to one of the most eminent theologians of the 20th century, Louis Cardinal Billot, S.J. Billot played a role in writing St. Pius X's great anti-modernist encyclical, Pascendi, and his major treatises are considered milestones in dogmatic theology. And lo and behold, in his Tractatus de Ecclesia, Billot teaches the opposite of Messer Salsa and Cisco. There, the Cardinal not only confirms the simple theological truth underlying the Sede Vacantis position, public heresy automatically takes you out of the church, and if you are a heretic, automatically strips you of your office or your authority, but he also specifically adduces the case of Nestorius to prove it. First, here is the general principle that Billot lays down. To be sure, whoever dwells outside the church is ipso facto rendered unfit for all ordinary jurisdiction, that is, episcopal jurisdiction. The reason is that a person who has ordinary jurisdiction or truly episcopal jurisdiction possesses the dignity of being the head, and no one can be the head of even a particular church if he is not a member of the church. Then, as proof for the foregoing, Bio quotes a passage from the letter of Pope Celestine on the excommunications that Nestorius had pronounced against Catholics who opposed the heresiarch's errors. These excommunications or removals from office were invalid, said the Pope, because Nestorius, quote, had already called down upon himself a divine judicial sentence, unquote. The acts were not valid, quote, from the moment that Nestorius and those like him began to proclaim such heresy, unquote. While a bishop who is a secret heretic still enjoys authority in the church, Bio concludes, he loses his jurisdiction, quote, from the time at which he begins to preach heresy openly. For the full quotes from Cardinal Billot, together with a lengthy and excellent refutation of Messrs. Salsa and Sisko's other errors about the Nestorius affair, see the Novus Ordo Watch site at this address. In their rambling response to the Novus Ordo Watch post, Messrs. Salsa and Sisko only got themselves in deeper by implying that Billot was wrong. And then in this passage, by wrongly conflating loss of jurisdiction and excommunication. Such mistakes are perhaps forgivable in an amateur, but deadly for the Society of St. Pius X's anointed and luminous experts. And while we're at it, I should add that since I'm not working for H&R Block on the side, perhaps Mr. Salsa, a tax attorney, should spare us his theological deductions and concentrate on income tax deductions instead. 
But the main point of our first Pope Fictions video should be clear. Cardinal Billot, one of the most eminent theologians of the 20th century, directly contradicts Salsa and Sisko's pronouncement on the affair of Nestorius. Billot also clearly and directly affirms the principle underlying sedevacantism, that a heretic loses his jurisdiction, quote, from the time at which he begins to preach heresy openly. The quote from Cardinal Billot demonstrates how Catholic theology leads to common sense conclusions. In this case, the conclusion is as follows. Because of the harm he could do to the faith of his subjects, a cleric who is a public heretic automatically loses his ordinary jurisdiction. Most Catholics agree with this position, at least instinctively, and that's the real point. They reject the Vatican II changes, and rightly so. But the reason these changes are non-Catholic is that they come from non-Catholics, men who projected a pretense of true authority, but who had none because of public heresy. But is it too taxing to grasp the simple principle and judge accordingly? If so, look for help, as we did, to a Catholic cardinal, not to a cheesehead and his buddies and certainly not to a tax attorney. If you found this video helpful, please consider supporting our apostolate through www.sggresources.org. God bless you.